Daz doesn't like going out and buying, you know, off the shelf antivirus or any malware or active web threat protection. But what Daz is, Daz is a tool that an organization can use to have a higher degree of security enablement, right? Fancy way of saying, DAS, while not being a security solution, can help to make a customer or an environment or an organization inherently more secure, right? So how does that happen, right? And that's where the Swiss Army knife concept comes from. What DAS does is it allows an organization to have a higher degree of security, to have more easily implementable mobility, right? So we can now embrace the hybridization of our workforce a little bit easier. We can work with remote workers um, where it makes sense to do so. We can do all that while simultaneously increasing these, those users' productivity, which then in turn makes their user experience better, which then in turn makes the customer experience better for any external folks that those users are working with. And we can do all of that while also helping an organization simplify its logistics. For sure. Okay, so today, we're going to get real, Kevin. Um, I think from last session, you know, we talked a lot about DAS use cases. Um, we talked about, you know, how DAS is inherently secure. So essentially it is a security solution. But as you like to talk about, um, it really, well, I'll let you get into that. But we talked about security. We talked about disaster recovery and continuity. Um, we talked a lot about use cases, right? So today we want to dispel any hesitation that you might have when you're going into a conversation with a customer uh, who is potentially a DAS prospect, right? Um, I think most of us know, and if not, then we can cover that today, but most of us know like who might be a good fit for Evolve IP's DAS solution. In addition to that, we want to talk about kind of the the topic today is the Swiss Ar Swiss Army knife, which Kevin uh, I believe coined. Um, but we'll we'll basically cover that. But again, we just want to get real about this because we want our partners to feel confident when they identify an opportunity, and you know we don't want any reason why you shouldn't be able to go into that conversation and uh, come away with uh, you know knowing that it's a good fit. So, Kevin, where should we start? Should we start with uh, how DAS is the Swiss army knife of technology solutions? Yeah, yeah, it works for me, Zach. All right. So what do you mean by that? And how did you come up with that nomenclature? Uh, yeah, so great question, right? So what exactly is it that we mean when we say DAS is a Swiss army knife of IT solutions or cloud-based solutions? Well, I think it all ties into something you just hit on, Zach, right? How can we enable ourselves, our our partners, our the agents who work for the partner? Like, how, how can we all feel a lot more comfortable having these conversations? And look, this is a technology solution, right? And the technology on the back end that makes this solution available can be complicated, right? You know, certainly, if it's something you don't have a, a background or familiarity in, you know, what the moving pieces of how a desktop solution is provisioned and delivered and administered and secured and managed. Um, there's a lot to it, right? How that interacts with infrastructure, where that infrastructure lives, what that connectivity looks like. And I feel like a lot of times, especially historically, where we've all uh, struggled, and, and I've seen this in, in the channel as well as direct, um, is that we try to go into the conversations from that technology first perspective. And, you know, I, I would venture to say that to me, right, if we're talking about DAS and, and specifically selling DAS or identifying a DAS opportunity or, you know, shepherding that conversation of identifying that opportunity to making someone an, a viable prospect, it's not a technology conversation. It can be, right? If you're comfortable having the technology conversation, by all means, feel free to do so. Um, but where where I've seen a lot more success is that it's a value-based conversation, right? What value does this solution, when implemented properly, bring to a customer? And then leaving some of the, well, you know, we understand what the building blocks are, but how do we put those building blocks together to build the foundation of what we want to provide them? to you know that collective effort as we go forward right so where evolve can come in and i can be on those calls from a discovery perspective and a solutioning perspective um so 
that that's a lot, right? What that means to me in essence, and when we talk about DAS being a Swiss army knife, it's a Swiss army knife of value, right? What's the value prop that a DAS solution has for us as a seller, for an agent, as a, you know, someone out there selling the solution, and most importantly, for the potential customer who's buying it. You hit on one, which sounds like it was, you know, kind of the, the paramount point of the previous conversation, which was security, right? And Zach, I'm going to, I'm going to nitpick with you here, right? You said something on our intro that, you know, I don't know that I necessarily fully 100% agree with, right? And and your words were DAS is a security solution. Now, I understand the intent there, and I definitely agree with the intent. But I would absolutely say that in my mind, right, from the technology side of things, DAS is not in and of itself a security solution, right? DAS isn't like going out and buying, you know, off-the-shelf antivirus or any malware or active web threat protection. But what DAS is, DAS is a tool that an organization can use to have a higher degree of security enablement, right? Fancy way of saying, DAS, while not being a security solution, can help to make a customer or an environment or an organization inherently more secure, right? So how does that happen, right? And that's where the Swiss Army Knife concept comes from. What DAS does is it allows an organization to have a higher degree of security, to have more easily implementable mobility, right? So we can now embrace the hybridization of our workforce a little bit easier. We can work with remote workers um, where it makes sense to do so. We can do all that while simultaneously increasing these, those users' productivity, which then in turn makes their user experience better, which then in turn makes the customer experience better for any external folks that those users are working with. And we can do all that while also helping an organization simplify its logistics, right? So not just making its IT administration easier for its systems, for its cloud-based systems, for its in-house solutions, but actually helping them get out of the game of having to go out and procure equipment, provision equipment, provide equipment to their users, and then reclaim that equipment if, if there's need for a change. So I know that was a very long answer to a very short question, but hopefully that that kind of helps to paint that picture, right? If I if I had that mental image in my head of the you know the Swiss Army knife, we all know that you know patent red design with the little cross on it. The the four things that are coming out of that Swiss Army knife are security, mobility, productivity, and logistics. Um, hundred percent agree. Uh, so last week or the last session, Gary made a bold claim. And everybody's jaws. I'm shocked to hear that. I am absolutely shocked to hear that Gary made a bold claim. Um, he said that DAS is cheaper than laptops and PCs. Now we talk a lot about ROI, and I know it's your favorite conversation, um, but it's something that's on every partner's mind, right? When they go into a conversation, the CIO, CTO, you know, they're already dealing with you know, constrained budgets or, you know, um, conservative budgets, right? So how can partners confidently go into a conversation with CIO, CTO, CISO and say, DAS is actually cheaper than buying new laptops and new PCs? Yeah, um, it, it's it's definitely something that, historically has been a challenge, right? Because the way people have approached this in the past is they'll look at going out and buying a business grade laptop, right? Let's just say a business grade laptop costs $1,800, right? We'll kind of pick a nice round number. And then we look at the cost of DAS and a DAS seat might cost again, just kind of shooting from the hip here, but let's just say $50 per user per month. So $50 per month times 12 months times three years, versus the cost of that laptop, right? And it's it's going to be very, very hard for DAS to stack up in that cost comparison when you do that direct head-to-head -head cost. So I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, well, Zach just said DAS can be cheaper, right? Gary made that bold claim that DAS can be cheaper. And now here comes Kevin as, you know, the wet blanket thrown on the conversation. Say, well, that's not true. But that's not true if we don't look at the big picture, right? The big picture is there's a huge soft cost piece that goes along with this, right? And and a prospective customer organization has to really work to have a firm understanding of 
what are their costs for securing those devices, right? Going out and buying things like edge point detection response, uh, managed detection response, uh, pa uh, excuse me, active and passive antivirus for their client devices, right? What are the costs of administering that environment today, of supporting that environment, right? We find when we look at industry averages, um, the numbers tend to come back with, an organization can see an up to 60% reduction in their help desk um, costs, right? So the cost of supporting their user base in a DAS environment or a VDI environment versus a traditional desktop environment. Um, we also can see a 20 to 30% reduction in administrative costs for doing all the user administration for that same year group, right? So not just the, the help desk support of keeping the lights on, keeping those users running, keeping their applications going, but also how do we equip those users with devices? How do we you know, get them into their hands? How do we make sure everything from a security perspective is accounted for? The other part of that is um, you know, backup, right? So we have a, a challenge today where if you have a distributed workforce, people are working by VPN, saving stuff down locally on their machines, we need to make sure that all of that stuff is being backed up as well. So there are backup costs that come with that decentralization too. Whereas you know, in a data solution, everyone's coming into the data center to do their work. So it's very easy for us to secure that environment. It's very easy for us to do backup of that environment. It's very easy for us to have business continuity and disaster recovery for that environment because the data is never leaving the data center. The other piece of this is when it comes to quantifying the cost of the potential for data loss, right? So, you know, DAS, and I'm sure this came up in, in last week's conversation too, but DAS lets us have those four logical walls that I always love to say that we build around our data center, right? And people come into those walls to do their work. In a traditional computing environment, everybody's coming into our four logical walls, taking the data that they want to work on to their local device, and if that device gets compromised, if it gets lost, if it gets stolen, that data is now out in the open, right? So as an organization, what are the, the risks that are associated with that higher potential for data loss or interruption of your operations or the cost of having to you know, file a, a breach notification, right? Saying that, that there was an issue. What are the costs of potential downtime for a ransomware attack if Zach's personal laptop got compromised and then he used that to VPN into Evolve IP's data center and then spread that ransomware from his device into our environment because we allowed his device be, to become an extension of our internal network, right? We can eliminate all that with DAS. Uh, and I think that's something that from a cost perspective, once you start to factor in all of those things, you know, I don't, I probably have never said this statement before in my life, but I don't disagree with Gary. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that's a, it's a great point from, from Gary's perspective there of, yeah, DAS certainly can be an all-in cheaper solution that also gives us the ability to have some additional benefits. So that was a, obviously a lot, but I want to kind of put this onto the group in general. Does does that make sense to everybody? Like what Kevin said around cost and and we haven't really covered ROI, but let's just kind of open it up. So does anybody have any questions around how, how DAS is effectively cheaper than PCs and laptops? Because again, I want you guys to feel confident when you're having these conversations. So go ahead and, you know, chime in, raise your hand, what, whatever. But um, anything from the group on like cost, you know, from a cost perspective. While we're giving everybody a minute, Zach, one other thing too that, that I you know, would definitely bring up is extension of your device lifetime too, right? If a company is on a three-year hardware refresh cycle where they go out and buy new laptops, new desktops every three years, every four years, with DAS, since we're now kind of making that device largely irrelevant from a, a resource perspective because people are doing their computing in the cloud-based environment, now that device refresh might not have to happen for six years, seven years, eight years. You might be able to continue to use that device, um, you know, until it won't power on anymore, until the screen stops working. So that that's another piece to consider too, as far as you know, what the frequency of those hard cost replacements are. Okay, I've got some stuff coming into the chat. Um, Mark Cook has his hand raised. Uh, Mark, come on, and you can unmute yourself and. Hopefully turn your camera on, <laughs> but Mark, what do you got for us? Hello, fellas. How you doing? Thank you for inviting me on. Um, when it comes to the evolve, uh, the cost of being cheaper in laptops and uh, PCs, 
Uh, are you working on that since you heard that quote as a marketing trip? I could. It's, I mean, it's something that we could definitely put together. Okay, cool. Thank you. That's it. Cool. Um, let me just make that note really quick. Cost drip sequence. Yeah, so while um, you're taking that note, Zach, I see um, Rich, I believe, had his hand up as well, but it looks like he dropped his question in the chat here. So, Rich, feel free to, to unmute and, and you know pop your camera on if, if it makes sense to do so. But um, if your question is the one in the chat, that, that's a great point, right? So does DAS exclusively work in a BYOD or, or you know environment or keeping the hardware existing, right? Anything you would you would expand on the question before I answer? Give me yeah. talk. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, that seems to be the model that you guys are kind of pushing towards and and then how do we you know as as advisors talk to a, our customers about you know what if they don't want their people bringing their own device but mm -hmm. they do they still want to provide it they could probably buy a lower priced laptop something just a you know basic web browser type almost like a google chrome but you know mm -hmm. is that that kind of the model that seems to be working or <clears throat> yeah, no, uh, great, great question, Rich. Um, so we would love to see all organizations that can out there start to adopt a bring your own device uh, approach or, or BYOD for anybody who might not be familiar with the, the acronym there. Um, that said, we do find that a lot of organizations still aren't quite ready to make that jump. Um, Many times it's specifically because there's compliance requirements or security requirements in their past that they just have an aversion to it. Um, a lot of times often that also comes down to, hey, you know, seven years ago we had an audit and one auditor's interpretation of the rules that face our organization said that we can't do this, right? We have to have company issued devices that we still lock down and secure. So we, we see a mix, right? Um, we definitely see some BYOD customers. I think we see a little bit more folks looking to bring their own devices or, or allow users to bring their own devices than we did three, four years ago. But even that, I'd say we're still maybe 50-50 and maybe even 60-40 for organizations that still want to outfit their people with some form of a company-issued machine. So, Rich, you hit the nail on the head, right? What that means then is they can do so with a much cheaper device, right? A much more inexpensive laptop, desktop, thin client, zero client that they put out there into their users' hands. And they can also do so with having a significantly lower amount of work, right? Less work, less time spent on provisioning that device once they get it in-house. So they don't have to worry about, you know, putting as much software on it, have to worry about locking it down as much, because in essence, that user is just going to use that device as a dumb terminal to get to the cloud-based data seat where they do their work. Um, the one piece that you mentioned in there that I think is still a little bit of an uphill battle, when people hear cheap devices, a lot of folks tend to immediately gravitate towards Chromebooks. Chromebooks are, are okay for that solution, but one of the big challenges with Chromebooks is that Chromebooks plus DAS are okay for a productivity user, right? They're fine for connecting to a desktop and doing, running your applications, doing your work. But if you want to do one of the things that Evolve IP specializes in with DAS, which is real-time audio and video, right? So calls like this, WebEx, Teams, Zoom, um, that's something that Chromebooks still struggle with because they, at this point in time, don't officially quote unquote support real-time audio and video or RTAV optimization with DAS. So just something to keep in mind, right? You know, you can still, instead of getting that $1,800 laptop, you can still equip them with maybe a $300 thin client or, you know, a three or $400 laptop running Windows, running Linux, running Mac OS. If you can find a $300 laptop running Mac OS, let me know, I'd buy it too. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that that's definitely the the option there of being able to to really slim down not just the the cost of the device, but how much work has to go into prepping and maintaining that device too. Yeah. I would also like to add, like when you're talking about BYOD versus company issued devices, it doesn't have to be either or, right? You know, you don't have to you don't have to you know make a company wide policy that says you know we are now a bring your own device organization right it just further you know when we when we talk about the the workforce of tomorrow you know there are a lot of people today that just prefer to use their macbook or they prefer to use whatever so it just allows the organization to say okay we can now be more flexible because we can 
you know, centrally, uh, you know, provide these virtual desktops to any device. That could be a company uh, issued um, piece of hardware or or theirs, right? So it just it it gives them it gives the organization more flexibility. Um, again, not an either or. I just wanted to kind of touch on that. Okay. Yeah, I, I think people are going to be hard pressed to, especially the IT guys who want to stay in control, to let go of that. Okay, just bring your own device. You know, they they want to keep some of that control and want to know <clears throat> the costs associated with the hardware. I mean, obviously, if we can tell them, hey, you're going from an eighteen hundred dollar, you know, business grade laptop down to a four hundred dollar almost consumer grade, and you're going to get the same job done. I, I think that's an important differentiation for them and that that could help make it make a sale so yeah and rich one of the pieces that we kind of <laughs> left off of that was in your question is you know just continuing to to utilize already existing hardware that's deployed right so that that's another mm -hmm. big win there right? so then it already has those devices that are in the field and you know i i agree with you right some it folks tend to kind of wrap their arms around the environment a little bit and like <laughs> to have that level of control but then i think the sale for those folks is look Keep the level of control you have. Keep the combination devices that are already in place, but extend their life for another three, four, five years. Um, and and I think you'd be hard pressed to find folks that would be interested in not having to go through that procurement cycle again and and getting everything out there from both a cost perspective and a time perspective. Yeah. Cool. Um, Jerry Gobb had a question about ransomware, and then we'll go with uh, Mark's question. Um, so how does Daz deal? And this is uh, Jerry Gobb. So Jerry, if you want to hop on, and potentially expand on that, um, that'd be great. But uh, unless he doesn't, so how does Daz deal with ransomware, Kevin? Yeah, yeah, another great question. If, if Jerry does jump in, I'll I'll stop talking and let let someone else speak. But um, so hey. ransomware is obviously a huge. Oh, sorry, was that Jerry? No, you could. What, what okay. question? The the quote that I'm getting for the barber shop. He wants to have a work number, right? So I know a lot of this Comcast things come with a work mobility line or voice line. But how does he, not to waste that included benefit, how does he make that kind of like a void half on the phone? Like, like does, does it even have it? Uh, well, no, it's you, what the we're requiring for. You know. Yeah, Alberto, unfortunately, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you, Zach. I'm not sure if you're able to to catch that question, but I think he was asking um, his customer owns a barbershop and he's looking to have his own VoIP number. I'm not sure how that like are you look is, is he looking to do that inside of a, a virtual desktop, Alberto? Yeah, you can answer my Hang on. Um, okay. can, let's get, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm going to tag uh, Alberto in the chat. Um, can we get back to how does Daz deal with the ransomware really quick? Yeah, yeah. And we'll, yeah, like I said, we'll certainly circle back and, and can give more detail there. But um, yeah, so from a ransomware perspective for, for Jerry's question. So, Jerry, it, it's a great point, right? The reality is a desktop is a desktop is a desktop, right? It doesn't matter if it's running on a physical device sitting here on my desk, if it's running in the cloud, if it's running in Amazon workspaces, if it's running in Azure virtual desktop, every potential desktop is throw, still a threat vector for our environments, right? Folks can compromise it, folks can attack it. Um, you can have malware, you can have ransomware, you can have viruses that, that all can come in through those devices. So we don't wanna think of a DAS desktop, which is really just a virtual desktop running in a data center, any differently than we think of how to secure any other desktop or laptop. What DAS does allow us to do though, is to focus solely on that virtual desktop that's already in our data center and take our focus away from these physical devices that are sitting out there on our users' desks. So if my laptop right now were to get compromised, that's, you know, my Philly is gonna come out, right? That sucks for me, right? My laptop's compromised. I'm gonna have a productivity loss as a result of that. But there's no potential for that compromisation of my device to get into a Evolve IP's network. 
because my device and Evolve IPs and, and the Evolve IP DAS seat that I talk to do not have the ability to send data back and forth to one another aside from just, you know, the way I'm using it with the screen capture and, or excuse me, screenshotting and keystroke um, uh, back and forth, right? So the, the input output devices. So what DAS allows to do is to really limit those threat vectors, right? It becomes a lot easier for us to administer those cloud-based desktops that are running in the data center because we already have access to them, right? They're directly right in front of us. We can have easier management to them, easier administration for them. Uh, becomes a lot easier for us to patch them to eliminate zero day vulnerabilities, right? So things that you know were, were defects in our operating system or our applications that don't get resolved until Microsoft or our application vendor releases a patch, Hey, if it takes us two, three weeks to apply that patch, that's an additional two, three weeks of risk, you know, that that device could potentially be compromised. We can patch our, our cloud-based DAS desktops immediately upon availability of those critical updates from the application and OS vendors. Um, we also have the ability to, you know, restrict access um, for things like clipboard redirection, right? So you know, being able to, to really lock down and have, you know, both physical logical walls that are in place between our underlying client devices and our client devices running in a DAS solution. So hopefully that helps, but if not, certainly happy to uh, to talk through it a bit more, um, you know, either as a group or one-on-one -on -one as it makes sense to do so. But yeah, ransomware is, is definitely a, a topic um, a, a, that, that's hot in the media these days, right? We see, you know, countless unfortunate um, compromisations that are occurring at seemingly every level of industry and government. So something we, we definitely wanna really make sure that we're discussing with our clients with our prospects um, and positioning this as a, a tool that we can help to solve some of the problems that they they might have. So I can probably sum all that up too, right? I'm a huge fan of, of the idea that DAS to me, as, as someone who was a systems administrator in the past, DAS is much more easily manageable than trying to go out and manage 200, 300 laptops and desktops scattered all around the country or all around the world, right? As an IT admin, there's one touch point, everything's in one location, I can get to it quickly and easily. I don't have to wait for someone to send me a device, bring me a device, figure out how to connect to Zach's machine in you know, the Midwest. Um, but in doing all of that, right? So manageability, to me, equals security, right? A more manageable environment becomes a more secure environment because it's, again, easier for us to more quickly and easily do things like patch distribution, right? Do things uh, like ensure our antivirus definitions are, are put out there in a timely fashion. Uh, ensure that if there's an, a, a hit on a machine from an antivirus or any malware perspective, that we can immediately isolate that machine and work with the user to remediate and correct right away. Excellent. Um, anybody else have any questions that they can think of right now? Otherwise, I I've see, got something. I see one from Gloria in the um, chat asking about how um, UCAS would perform in a data seat. So, um, Gloria, I don't know if, if you wanted to to maybe elaborate on the question either, uh, but certainly happy to answer as is. But if you wanted to to add anything to it before we jump into it, I will take that as a strong maybe. Um, so that's it's another great question, right? So unified communications um, is obviously something that that is in Evolve IP's wheelhouse, right? We as a company, you know, staked our claim. We were founded as a unified communications company back before it was unified communications, right? When it was just voice over IP. So the intersection of UCAS, CCAS, and DAS um, for us is is really like our our preferred place to play, right? And and for if for no other reason than selfishly. You know, we want to make absolute sure that our solutions work well hand in hand together. So what that means from a functional perspective is when we design a DAS solution, right, we want to make absolute certain that what we do from a UCAS perspective works in it. Uh, we want to make sure that what we do from a CCAS perspective works in it, because ideally we love to sell all of that stuff to our potential customers. Um, and the inverse is true too, right? All the development that we do from a UC and CC perspective, we're doing with a mind toward the fact that folks will likely be running this, if not today, then tomorrow in some form of a VDI or DAS solution. So mm -hmm. what makes Evolve IP different there is that you know, we're the only company, I think, if not, then one of very few who have both a deep technical background and a wealth of experience in the voice side. 
uh, as well as in the compute side. So, you know, we we make sure from the ground up that everything that we're doing allows us to really look to leverage that real-time audio and video optimization capability so that unified communication platforms and contact center platforms and collaboration platforms like Teams, like Zoom, like WebEx, um, all run effectively in the desktop solution. Now, I won't get like too far down into the technical weeds, but what all that means, right? Because I talk about Evolve IP's solutions, right? We make sure our UCAS works and our CCAS works. And, you know, that's great. But what if a customer is under contract with another provider, right? What if they already have five nines or they have Ring or they have someone else? Well, historically, that might have been the point at which we had to stop talking, right? But not anymore, right? Now we're in a position where, look, the reality is most unified communication and contact center solutions under the covers are doing the same thing, right? They're all leveraging the same protocols. It's either HTML5 for a collaboration engine or WebRTC for a software-based client. And if we can optimize those things um, through DAS with our solutions, in essence, we can really optimize them with anyone's. So we, we went through a, a pretty arduous certification process with a couple of vendors already to say that their platforms are quote unquote certified to work in Evolve IP's DAS solution. Uh, but we're happy to do that testing with any of your prospective clients for any of the UCAS or CCAS solutions that they want to leverage. Again, at the end of the day, WebRTC traffic is WebRTC traffic and HTML5 traffic is HTML5 traffic. So we can optimize one. Um, even if the vendor themselves don't have a way to optimize their application, there are other ways that we can work through things like browser redirection to make optimization available as well. Cool. Um, let's go to Mark's question. Um, I think this will be a pretty quick answer, but does does an organization have to migrate all their users to, to DAS or can only some people migrate over, such as remote sales? No, they, they just have to pay for everyone. They don't have to use it. <laughs> that, that's that's the, the absolute sales answer, right? No. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, historically, one of the challenges I think we saw is organizations tended to have this all or nothing approach. And frankly, that's not necessary anymore, right? So organizations can can take the approach of leveraging this for users for whom it makes sense. Um, and then looking to most likely scale up once they see how successful it's implemented and what that experience post implementation is like. So if you had a you know a 300 person shop that said, hey, we want to do this for 60 users, but we're not ready for the other 240 either because they don't need it, their use case doesn't support it, or we just want to start small and then see how it goes and then grow from there. No problem at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know we're we're happy to to allow companies to you know bring in the folks for whom it makes sense and and look to maybe consider adding the the other users in the future <coughs> one thing to keep in mind with that though right when we talk about DAS, right customers are running applications in these desktops so the things that those applications are talking to from a, an infrastructure perspective have to be taken into account as well so again we'll just kind of go with some easy round numbers let's say you're a 200 person company and you want to do DAS for 100 people but not the other 100 but when folks are connecting to your DAS solution, they're connecting to some form of an application that runs on a server in your data center today. We want to make sure we keep in mind that the user experience might be a little different for folks that are in the DAS solution versus the on-prem solution, depending on where the back end for those applications resides. Now, from a connectivity perspective, again, I know a lot of uh, people here with a, a whole lot more kind of telecom and circuit experience than, than I've ever had in my life. But Fortunately, with the the you know amount of bandwidth available at, at relatively low costs, these things are becoming increasingly less important in the consideration. But we do want to make sure we're always thinking about latency. And I know I think this is going to lead into what the next question here is. But we want to make sure we're always thinking about latency for you know what that stuff's talking to. The reason I bring that up now is that latency conversation becomes a lot easier when everybody is coming over together, right? Because if everybody comes over, then the backend supporting infrastructure to support those applications is likely coming too. Um, if that stuff's going to live elsewhere, either in the public cloud, on-prem at the customer site, in a customer's own data center, um, we just need to make sure we think through that all as part of the discovery process. And to me, that that goes back to, hey, look, this is a very technical solution, but you know, from a, a value prop perspective, um, you know, we can certainly have those conversations. Then we're happy to to dig in with you guys to to dig, to get to that level of nuance and, and in the technical weeds. So if they have homegrown applications that are in a data center or at their headquarters, it's not a barrier to entry. It just has to be engineered or thought out. Correct. Yep. Engineer thought out. And to me, the most important thing is tested, right? So one of the things that we'll do in every engagement 
um, is work with a customer to allow them to have access to something like a demo seat so that they can test what their latency experience is like for their users from where they're connecting. Um, we also do a lot of like pilot to production or proof of concept approaches where, you know, a customer will define the success criteria for when we actually do their production DAS build out and make sure that their applications perform up to whatever standard they have before they move forward with the rest of their implementation. So I, you know, I can't underscore the importance of testing enough. We can certainly do very detailed discovery. We can dig into it with the customer, but ultimately the only way for all of us to collectively be sure, and, and you know, if I were the person in the buying situation, I would never probably move forward without seeing something firsthand myself to know that my applications um, performed and functioned as expected. All right. Um, George, I think we touched on your latency question. Do you want to add to that at all, George? Yes, um, in the past, uh, and I think Daz has been out there for about mm, seven, eight years. And one of the er earlier stages when I was selling it was there was there were issues with um, large applications being properly uh, being able to work in a Daz environment, such as CAD CAM for engineers and uh, architects and MRIs, big files for doctors. So my concern is, is you, and I know you could do a proof of concept, but you know, to what confidence do, do we have today that we can approach a healthcare organization or an architectural firm and say, hey, you know, your performance shouldn't be an issue. Uh, yes, you could run a POC, but um, just want to hear any comments of any recent developments or any stories that you might have, short ones, of course, about you know, large heavy applications being able to perform uh, successfully. Yeah, no, that's a great question, George. And, and Zach will tell you, I, unfortunately, all the stories I know are exceptionally long, right? It seems <laughs> like one, once I get on a roll with these things, I apologize to everyone. I can't stop myself, but I just get so excited in these conversations sometimes. Um, but yeah, from from an engineering and a healthcare perspective, it, it's 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 a really cool story, right? It's a really cool use case. And I will answer you completely differently today than I would have two years ago. So two years ago, I would have told you, uh, you know what, those types of organizations might not be a really good fit for VDI or DAS, right? And and you'll hear me use those terms interchangeably because they really mean the same thing. It's just a matter of who's doing the work, right? VDI is in-house, DAS is a provider like Evolve IP. So why, right? Why was it not a good fit then? Well, doing the work that CAD applications and, and medical imaging requires requires an additional piece of hardware for anybody not familiar called a GPU, right? Um, you know, so additional memory that's dedicated solely in a computer to high performing applications, right? So things like audio, video, rendering, 3D modeling. And when folks wanted to have a GPU based workload, they needed a GPU based server solution to make those desktops available from a data center. That was an expensive proposition, right? So for a company like Evolve IP to have that type of solution, we would have to go out and make a huge capital investment to have a whole bunch of hardware just sitting there in the event that someone might want to purchase it. So there weren't a lot of providers who really made that investment and had GPU-based DAS solutions that are sitting on the shelf ready to go. What's changed is now by working with Microsoft um, through our gold level partnership and having Azure as a potential location where we can offer our DAS out of in addition to our own two internal data centers. Now through Azure, we can make GPU based desktops available to those types of organizations. So Azure has a way for us to offer um, two gig, uh, I, believe it's, I believe it's two gig, four gig, eight gig, and 16 gig GPU options. And we actually, um, we used to, so it's funny, I, I was always the one that was kind of the gatekeeper of these types of engagements. And I would be the first person years ago to say like, yeah, they're an architectural firm, let's not even talk to them, we're wasting each other's time, there's no good solution for them. Uh, in the last year, we've onboarded, I think, three or four different architectural organizations that are running different versions of AutoCAD that are having a huge degree of success. Um, and again, to the cost portion earlier, they're doing so much more inexpensively than if they had to equip those users with laptops that had that GPU hardware on it. So long answer to a, to a straightforward question, George, for which again, I apologize. But you know, we, we can now offer that with GPU-based desktops that specifically cater toward that, that high utilization type user that are doing things like 3D modeling, imaging, and medical imaging. Okay, great to know. Thank you. Um, Rich was asking about uh, software that could not run on DAS. Rich, do you want to? Do you have like a specific use case that you're uh, that you wanted to bring up, or 
Not not necessarily that you guys kind of answered it. I was w- wondering about CAD and Autodesk and, you know, the medical imaging, CT scans, all that kind of stuff, because those are very, you know, like you said, graphic intensive. And, and uh, it sounds like you guys have it covered with the ability to offer the GPU uh, based processors. So that was it. Yep. You guys did it. Thank Perfect. you. All right, so for the group, I know we're coming up on time, but I wanted to ask the group, just in general, is there anything else today that might be stopping you from having the DAS conversation with your customer base? Anything that you can think of? Because again, the point of this call was just to make you all feel more confident. And if if you don't walk away from this feeling confident, I will be a sad boy. And look, if I can understand it, anybody can understand it, because I'll be the first person. First person, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing most of the time. (laughs) Anybody at all? Anybody have anything that might, you know, be leaving them feeling less confident about Daz? Because I just, I, you know, there there are so many use cases. There are so many. There's so many benefits and, and you know, going back to um, going back to, you know, the Swiss Army knife kind of concept. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can utilize this for your customer base. So, again, just if anybody has anything at all that might be holding them back from having these conversations, just please let us know so we can cover those. Um, please state the components of Army knife. Yeah, so Jerry, I'll, I'll, so I'm a big fan of like wordplay, mnemonic devices, and things like that, right? So the best way I can think, like the way we've kind of put this together, think of it as this, right? What are the benefits of DAS? It's simple, simple being S M P L: security, mobility, productivity, logistics. Those are the the four different things we want to think of as as the benefits that a DAS solution can bring us. And again, I, I think that that idea of tying it into, you know. DAS is a, is a solution that can help to simplify organizations, and it's a simple story to tell, and here are the simple benefits of what DAS can do for your company. And then Jess put in the chat, um, we don't support smaller accounts. Do you want to touch on that at all? Like, So we, ha- we do have a minimum user count of 50 DAS seats, I believe. Um, do you want to touch on that a little bit, Kevin? Yeah, um, yeah, happy to do so, right? So as you mentioned, um, Zach, you know, we, we do have that as a minimum in there. Um, I have seen us dip below it, but we tend not to dip too far below it too often. And, and the reason for that is is twofold, right? First and foremost, the financials of a DAS solution tend to make much more sense when you're in that 50, north of 50, north of 100 user range. Um, the reason for that is, you know, all the talk around DAS is, oh, well, how much does it cost per user? How much does it cost per user? That's great. But there also is a small infrastructure component that goes into a DAS solution too, right, for the supporting server architecture to make DAS available. And, you know, I say small, but that might be, again, let's do simple numbers here. Let's say say $1,000 or $1,500, right? So if we're taking that $1,000 and we're dividing it among 50 users, the, the impact of the cost per user isn't really all that significant. If we're taking that thousand dollars and dividing it by across ten users, now that financial impact cost per user becomes much more in, impactful to an organization and tends to be prohibitively expensive when amortized across the number of seats. Right. So it's not that you know we don't want ten user, fifteen user, twenty user shops. We'd love to do it. It's just that it starts to really not make a ton of sense from the customer's point of view when you start to look at you know the the cost of that. Also, smaller organizations tend to be more easily administrable. So a lot of the benefits that DAS gives an organization cater more toward, you know, SMB space, right? If you have a, if you're a 15 user shop looking to do IT for your users, it's a lot easier to administer and procure devices and provision those devices and provide those devices to 15 people than it might be for 1500. So it just becomes, you know, what what's the value in um how this solution can help a a customer of that size, I think there's a much more compelling story to tell when you're up around that 100 or more user mark. And I think, again, there's there's definitely value in that 50 to 100 range too, but once you're north of 100, that that to me is where it really becomes a game changer from an IT perspective. Cool. 
Kevin, do you want to touch on the uh, office in a box that we just released? Uh, yeah, Zach, if you want to tee it up a little bit, I don't know. Um, I haven't I haven't actually seen the uh, the release today, so I, I I've obviously worked on it in the background, but yeah, let me pull it up. Okay, so this uh, asset is not done. This is kind of a draft, but basically, let's go from there. So we have including Microsoft licensing and we have excluding Microsoft licensing. And it basically is just representing all the things that you get with that 9999 number or that 6899 number. It's pretty so, straightforward, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, so so what is it, right? What do you get for that figure? Well, you know, obviously we could sit here and go through every single line item in the wheel, but really in essence is you're getting a DAS solution, right? So you're getting an eight gig desktop that has the office applications or doesn't have the office applications, depending on what selections they make, that have security solutions layered into it for things like active and passive antivirus, right? So trend, enable, Cisco umbrella, firewalls, that also then include your unified communications and collaboration piece, right? So teams with direct routing. So yeah, you know, when we say office in a box, really this is is everything that an organization would need in order to, to really be functional. Um, you know, the, the, I think the only piece in here that's potentially not included by default would be contact center, but that's because even an organization that needs contact center likely doesn't need contact center for 100% of their users. So that's always like a, a little sidecar piece that you can opt in for here. But you know, this is everything, right? This is your Office 365 licensing, your backup, your security, your storage, your desktop, and your server infrastructure to support it. It's a pretty cool initiative. And I think yeah. at very, I think at very least, it'll get some uh, some good conversations and good interest going from from uh, end user organizations. So, does anybody have any questions about Office in a Box? I see some questions there, Zach, about when when we can expect to have this type of document public facing. Um, well, I'm going to send it to our designer today because I'm not a graphic designer, but um, it'll be sent off to the designer today and. By the end of the week, this will be in your emails. And I'll pro probably will attach this to the recording of this uh, um, this this session as well. But cool. Well, I guess we'll call it a wrap. Um, thank you all so much for coming by, Kevin. Thank you for your expertise and for being our Daz Guru. Um, I hope everybody has a great rest of the week. And uh, if anybody has any questions at all, feel free to reach out to myself or Kevin. Kevin loves to get emails and he loves to get put on calls uh, without notice or advance notice. So uh, <laughs> it's like the lightning round of my of, of a game show, right? I, I love it. Or, or you know, a congressional hearing where you just sit there and get rapid fire questions that you have to yes. have a good answer for. But no, um, all joking aside, guys, um, again, appreciate everybody's time. Appreciate the, the awesome questions. Appreciate the conversation. Look forward to having a lot more of it. And as Zach said, right, both he, myself, the rest of our channel team, let us know how we can help um, because, you know, yeah, this is great for for putting the bait on the hook and then you know once you guys start to feel some some tapping at the end of the line um you know bring us in let us let us help um you know we'll certainly never do anything to to put you guys in a bad spot and look forward to uh winning and closing a lot of daz deals together hopefully in the very near future amen to that all right everybody thank you so much expect the recording and uh this office in a box um by the end of the week and we will talk to you all and see you all in the next one Take care, everybody. Take care.